Hey, thanks for checking out FBC Rankin online. Our mission as a church is to love God, love people, and to be for the 912. If you live within the 912 area code, we'd love to see you in person real soon at a service. If you live outside the 912, we'd love to get connected with you and get you plugged in with a local church somewhere near you. Enjoy the service. Good morning, everybody, and uh, we have had some beautiful weather. Uh, the only bad part about that is my allergies are going crazy. So um, I know this looks a mess more than normal, and that's fine. All right, so just you're just you're the ones who got to look at it, not me. So just deal with it. Uh, this morning we are in uh, stronger number three. All right, we're doing this series about getting stronger and being stronger. And this morning, I want to talk to you about a different aspect of being stronger and dealing with our strength. And it is a, a part of our strength that so many of us tend to take for granted or that we just overlook. And so there's a little bit of a shift or a little bit of a twist to what we're going to be looking at this morning in dealing with getting stronger. And so what we're going to talk about this morning, we're going to be in the Old Testament. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 32. All right, and we're going to be dealing with something that you have probably seen or read or heard preached on a bunch of times. I know myself I have, but I want to share with you and take some time this morning to share with you what, what God showed me, what God instructed me, what he revealed to me. And it's really pertinent to dealing with what we're dealing with, with getting stronger. We're going to be dealing with the, the Old Testament passage of where Jacob wrestles. He wrestles with a man in the wilderness. And there's a whole lot to the story. And so before we get to that, let's do a little bit of a short history and background of what is going on. You have Jacob and Esau who are brothers. They're twin brothers and Esau is born first. And so because he is born first and he's the first male, he gets a, he gets a birthright. When, when dad dies, he gets everything. He gets everything. Whatever, whatever dad has becomes his. So you have these two brothers and then you have Jacob who's behind him and he's like, well, I get, I get nothing. And so as they grow older and they, be, they become men and whatnot goes on and things happen and Esau comes to his brother and he's hungry and he's starving, and he's exhausted, he feels like he's gonna die and he's like, listen, I'm hungry. Do you have food for him? And he, and he goes, Jacob says, yeah, I got food for you, man. I got, I got some stew sitting over here. I'll give you some of it if you give me your birthright. And he says, okay. What do I care? I'm probably going to die anyway, and I don't really care, you know, so you can have it. So he, he trades his birthright for some stew. Their dad, Isaac, as he's getting older in age and he's ready to die, he can barely see, and he, he doesn't know a whole lot of what's going on, and he, he's at a bad, bad place. And, well, Jacob gets with his, his mother, and he's like, I want to I trick dad into giving me the blessing as well so I can get the inheritance of my brother and get all of these things and I can inherit what is rightfully Esau's. And so he, he tricks his father into giving him a blessing. That brings us to this place right here in, in Genesis. It says before we get to that though that Esau and Jacob always struggled they struggled together in their mother's womb and it was a foreshadowing of their adult relationship and what was going to happen you can read that in numbers but as we look at this we're going to fast forward a, a couple of years and now you have Jacob and Esau that are in this eternal kind of battle on this earth and Esau is extremely angry he is extremely mad he is he is very upset with Jacob and Jake he Jacob runs into some servants of Esau and they say hey listen your your brother's coming for you and he he's not happy there's going to be consequences for what you've done so Jacob makes preparations. He tries to divide all of his assets up and he sends, he sends a ton of all of his lifestyle, pretty much almost everything he has, he sends over to his brother as a, as a peace offering, as a gift. And he's like, here, take this. And then he takes his family. He takes his 11 sons. 
He takes his wives and his, his wives' servants and he takes them and they, they go out into the wilderness and they flee and they're, he, he's taking them and they get to this place called Jabbok, which is a stream, which is a river and they get there and he sends his family across the way and he's like, listen, you're gonna, you're gonna go and I'm sending you over to Esau. So in Genesis chapter 32, starting in verse 22, I'm reading from a new King James. If, if you don't have it, you can read up on the screen. Verse 22, and he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint, and he was wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penile, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. You've probably heard this a bunch of times, but there's some things in here that I really want to share with you. As they have this encounter and Jacob is in the wilderness, there's a lot for us to take in. Jacob is in a panic situation. He's in the wilderness at night. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've grabbed all of your children, your wife, and everything you've had, and you're like, let's get out of here, and you were in such a panic, you had to flee out into the woods or the wilderness just for safety in the cover of night. Like, there's a reality to this. This just isn't a, a story that we hear in Sunday school. This is, this is real life stuff that took place. There's a reality to it. That is some deep, deep panic. And he gets him to this place in the wilderness, this, this stream of Jabbok, and he says, listen, you guys go across. You, you get on the other side, and I'm sending you towards Esau. He sends everything that he loves and everything that he owns and everything that he has is gone. He's given Esau 580 animals total, now his wives, servants, sons, as an offering. This location is important. Jabbok is extremely important. You're going to find that out. It is a stream. It is a very significant place. It is 60 to 65 miles long. It's located between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. It's a very rapid flowing stream in the middle of the wilderness. Here's a slide for you to see kind of what it looks like. It's a very unique place. I want you to look at this for a second here, and I want you to notice something before we go to the next slide. I want you to see this. I want you to notice the water, and I want you to notice the, the, what is on the banks because it's very important. The banks... Along the, the river of Jabbok or the stream of Jabbok are covered with natural olives and almonds. It is an oasis in the middle of nothing. It is, it is a place where there is refuge, where there is life. The water is so crystal clear that, and purified that you could just drink it straight from the stream. It's a beautiful, gorgeous place. There's a, another picture that I have here for you to know, modern day, of what it looks like now. And he, he comes to this place, and it, the name Jabbok in Hebrew means emptying or pouring out. It is where Jacob came, and he had to empty himself and pour himself out. This is an amazing place for Jacob, and there's a little connection here for me and you in the Old Testament that we need to come to a place that's a Jabbok. We have to empty ourselves and we have to pour ourselves out. You have to come to the reality of yourself and you have to say who you really are and understand your own littleness. For Jacob, it was an understanding of who he was and we're going to break all that down and see all that. But in order for you to be what God wants you to be, in order for you to be who God made you to be, you must completely empty yourself of yourself and your selfish desires and your wants and your needs and do what he wants you to do. And that's very easy for us to hear and it's very easy for us to say, but it is a whole lot more difficult to live out. 
It's very easy for us to hear, but when we say, okay, well now push comes to shove and I've got to do it, now it's a little more difficult. And we can look at Jacob and we see what's going on and we're like, oh yeah, Jacob, you just got to do this. You got to empty yourself, man. It's, it's not that bad. But understand the reality of this. Verse 24, Jacob is all alone and he meets a stranger in the darkness. Understand the oddity of this. He's in the middle of the wilderness. He has just sent everything that he owns. Boom, here. That I have nothing left. I have no home. I have no wives. I have no children. I have no servants. I have nothing. I have absolutely nothing to my name. I am all alone in the middle of the night, in the darkest part of the night, in the wilderness. Anything can happen out here and a stranger appears in the middle of nowhere. If that does not freak you out, out, I don't know what would. And he, he has this encounter with this stranger and things escalate quickly. It erupts into a conflict and it lasts for pretty much the entire night and this man and him end up wrestling. What a scene. Picture all of this in your mind. Like this is a reality that is taking place. We come to find out that the man that he is wrestling with is God in the flesh. It is what is known is a Christophany. It is basically Jesus Christ showing up in, in human form in the Old Testament. So if you ever want to do any Bible studies or whatever and somebody says, oh, this is a Christophany, it is, he's done it multiple times. Jesus Christ shows up, God in the flesh, in the Old Testament. And Jacob is wrestling with God in the flesh. Jesus Christ himself. That is, that is what is broken down here. In case you haven't picked up on it, for Jacob, this was extremely personal. He wrestled with God while he was all alone. He was in pain, he was suffering, he was in darkness, and he was at a disadvantage. Verse 26, and he said, let me go for the day breaks, but he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. As they wrestled throughout the entire night, there was a ton for us to break down in this moment. Look closer as what is said and what is being said. It's very interesting because the details matter. And so it's very interesting the conversation that is had. And when we read this, Jesus says the son of God or God in the flesh, whatever, it doesn't matter what you want to say about it, but it's God in the flesh, says to Jacob, who is 97 years old, he says, let me go for the day breaks. Are you serious? Whether it's God in the flesh or it's Jesus Christ, whatever one you want to pick, it doesn't matter. You're telling me that God in the flesh or Jesus Christ cannot outmaneuver or overpower a 97-year-old man who's exhausted, who's broken, who's hurt. They're, they're wrestling and, and God in the flesh and Jesus Christ can't overpower this 97-year-old man? Are you serious? There's more to it than that. It's not about being overpowered. It's not about trying to win. It wasn't trying to, to say, listen, I'm going to put my dominance on you. Look at what he says. He says, let me go. This was not a conflict of dominance. This wasn't one man trying to impose his will on another man. This wasn't one man trying to have dominance over another man into submission. This wasn't a wrestling battle. This wasn't a struggle where like, I am bigger, I am stronger, I am more ferocious, I am more powerful and you're going to know it. That's not what this was. This was not a conflict of dominance. This, when you read this and you see what he says, he says, let me go. No, you have one man who is trying to hold on to another man and the other man is like, get off of me. That is a vast difference. There is one who is struggling and using everything they have to hold on to someone else because they don't want to let them go. And then you have God in the flesh saying, get off of me, get, get off of me. Why are you holding on to me? Get, get off of me. The day breaks, I'm going, get, get off of me. That brings us to the other part for the day breaks. Does Jesus have a curfew? Does God got somewhere he's got to be before the sun comes up? The day breaks, man. Get, get off of me. Quit holding on to me. Quit, man, get off of me. The, look, man, the day breaks. Tomorrow's coming. I, I, get off of me. 
If it was a struggle for dominance, who cares what to, when the sun comes up? Who cares when the day breaks? Who cares? I'm going to wrestle with you and I'm going to fight with you until I've beaten you, till I've got you into submission. But he's like, no, no, get off of me. Listen, the day breaks. God didn't have to go anywhere. Jesus didn't have a curfew. None of those things were taking place. What that is there for is for me and for you and for Jacob. See, when you look up the term, the day breaks, it is a Hebrew term. And it means the ascending of the dawn is about to happen. The sun isn't coming up. It's not the sunrise that's very different. If you've ever been out in the woods, if you've ever been camping, if you've ever been hunting, if you've ever been fishing, if you've ever been out in nature and you're out there before the sun comes up and you get out there at dark, you're out there around four o'clock in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, maybe five o'clock depending on the day, it is pitch black. It is the darkest part of the night. It is the darkest part of the day. It, it doesn't get any darker. And before the sun even shows its face, before the sun even shows up, you can see the sky start to lighten up just a little bit. And it's letting you know, listen, the sun is coming. The sun is coming. The new day is about to be here. But it is the darkest point. It is the darkest time. It is the hardest time. The sunrise is just there. And the reason that he says, listen, the day breaks, it was a Hebrew phrase that was used and it was an expression. It meant... Listen, the totality of something is coming to an end. And so Jesus is wrestling, God is wrestling with Jacob and Jacob won't let him go and he's like, get off of me, let me go. I'm trying to get away. The day breaks. Listen, the totality is coming. The end is coming. This night is coming to an end. Tomorrow is going to be here and tomorrow is going to become today for you. I got nowhere to be. But tomorrow is a big day for you. You have other things you need to be dealing with than wrestling with me. See, before the, the breaking of day, it is the night is almost over, the darkness is almost gone. Yesterday is about here. A new day is coming. Things are about to change in a big way. A new beginning is on the horizon. You are about to be able to see some things that you didn't see before because it was so dark. And it's time for you to experience what today has in store for you. The struggle must end at daybreak, not for God, not for Jesus, but for Jacob. And here's why, because now he must go face his tomorrow. He must go face what is waiting for him. He must go face what is out there. He, 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 he's not looking for personal gain. He's not, he's not giving God an ultimatum. But he says, listen, tomorrow is coming. And when he says, I will not let you go until you bless me, it's not what it sounds like. You have to read this in the right context. You have to read this in the right tone. You have to read this in the right reality that it is in. He's not saying, listen, man, I'm wrestling with you. And I'm going to wrestle with you until you bless me. That's not the tone that is used. It's more like this. I will not let you go until you bless me, man. Listen, I'm not letting you go because you're all I got. This is it. This is the darkest part of the day. This is the darkest part of my life. When that sun comes up, I know what's waiting for me. And listen, without your blessing, I'm a dead man. I will not let you go until you bless me. I need your blessing. Things move pretty quickly. Verses 27 and 28. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. So we have to ask the question, why would God in the flesh ask Jacob his name? Does he not know everything? Is he not all knowing? Does he already not? I mean, he's the one who appeared out of nowhere and started wrestling with this guy in the middle of the wilderness, in the middle of the night. He knows exactly who, is it, who he is, but we got to read this in the right context. And this is the part that God showed me that I was like, this changes everything. And he says to him, listen, what is your name? It's helpful for us to understand what Jacob's name meant. We found out that in Hebrew and Greek, names mean things. In Hebrew, Jacob means cheater, deceiver, liar, and trickster. We understand that God or Jesus, this Christophany that is there, we understand that he knows what he knows and he knows everything and he's, 
He's wrestling with Jacob and it's just about for daybreak to happen. It's the darkest point and he looks at him and he says, what is your name? And Jacob says, my name is Jacob. And we can take that at face value, but what it is, but he was saying a whole lot more than that. And the reason that he asked him what his name was is he was not asking him who you are and to identify yourself. He already knew that. He wanted him to confess what he is. He wanted to have this confession from him that he was a deceiver and a liar and a thief and a manipulator. That broke Jacob down to a place that so many of us can find familiar. He gave him an understanding of the heart of God and it broke him to his true core and it humbled him permanently, gave him a name to come to the end of himself. And I think there's a, there's a good illustration here that I want to share with you. There's a reality to this that we miss. It's no secret I have four sons. I don't know how this joker had 11. I, four is enough for me. All right, 11 is crazy. All right. But ever since, they, before they were born, before they were born, seriously, in my, in my wife's stomach, you know how babies would, they'll kick and they'll push and they'll rub against the, the mom's stomach, right? Well, because it's not my body and I don't care, I push back. My wife was not happy. And then they'd kick back and they'd push back. So I wrestled with them before they were even born. When they were little, we would wrestle all the time. We would wrestle constantly, all the time, four on one. They thought they had the advantage, but dad cheats. Dad's mean. Dad does stuff that is illegal. You didn't say no hair pulling. That's fine. Go ahead and pull hair. I'm good. Let's pull hair. All right. You ever wrestled with someone? I can't tell you how many times my wife would come to the top of the stairs and there's five of us in a room with no shirts on all. (sighs) I'll tell you what she hated. She hated the phrase, go get ready for bed. Because what we all heard was, it's time to get it on. It's exhausting. You're tired. I don't care who you're wrestling. I don't care who you're fighting with. I don't care who you're doing things with. If you've ever been engaged in a wrestling match and you've ever had to just go all out, it's exhausting. You have to understand that Jacob has been wrestling with God in the flesh, this Christophany, all night long in the wilderness, out in the darkness, out where it's not comfortable and he's wrestling with him and he's fighting with him and he touches his hip and he he messes up his hip, he pulls it out of socket, he's in pain, he's in agony, he has nothing left. He has nothing within him and all he's doing is holding on and he's trying to hold on because he knows who he's dealing with and who's in his presence and he's holding on and they're wrestling and it finally gets to the crescendo, it gets to the end of it all and it finally gets to the point where this Christophany goes, God in the flesh goes, listen, get off of me and shoves him off and he gets some space and he gets away from him. And you have to imagine like this is what is taking place. This is the reality, right? You have Jacob who's got a hip out of his socket. He's been holding on and he's just been wrestling with him and he's been holding on to him the whole time and he shoves him off and he's in the ground and he's just down. He's defeated. He's, he's broken and he's down there with his hip hurting and he's like, what is your name? And he's like, I'm Jacob. I'm a liar, I'm a thief, I'm a deceiver, I'm a manipulator, I'm not a good man, I'm not even a good person, I betrayed my brother, when that sun comes up and tomorrow gets here, it's all catching up to me. And I'm a dead man. And unless you bless me, because I know who you are, unless you save me, I have no tomorrow. That's why I held on with all the strength I had. Because when that sun comes up, it's over. It's over. My question to you is, If you had a Jabbok where you've come and you've said to God, I'm Josh. 
and I am. And you fill in what you are. And you are broken and you are emptied and you're exhausted because you've been through that darkest part of the night. You've been through that hardest part of whatever it is and you can see the dawn coming and the sun's coming up and you know that you're a dead man and you know that your sins are catching up to you and you know that those things are gonna happen to you. Have you had that place where you've come and you're like, without you, you are my only hope. I'm at the end of my rope. If you don't show up, if you don't bless me, I got no tomorrow. I gotta have that. I gotta have that. See, it's different when you put it into perspective. It's different when you look at it, you understand that it's reality. And it's different when you say, listen, there, there's a whole lot more happening here than just a conversation and him saying, I'm gonna try to overpower you. As Christophany looks at him and he says, because you struggled with God and you struggled with man because he's God in the flesh, so he struggled with both. Because you realized you're true who you are. Because you've confessed your sins. Because you know that I am your only hope. God is satisfied. He's so satisfied that he's going to change your name. And you're going to get your blessing. You're no longer Jacob. You're no longer the deceiver. You're no longer the liar. You're no longer the manipulator. You're none of those things. Now you are known as Israel, the one who persists with God. He simply changed his name and blessed him and gave him what he, what he needed so desperately because of him coming to the end of himself. This exchange takes place in verse 29. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. This is one of the coolest things about Jesus and about God that is really awesome. We just read over that and we miss it. It was so cool. I learned this. In that era, knowing a person's name gave you leverage. It was an advantage to you in any type of circumstance you could be in. It was believed that if you knew someone's name and you could have a, provide an advantage over them. You had leverage over them. You could walk around and be like, oh yeah, I know so-and-so and and I had a conflict with them and I beat them and gave you leverage. The cool part about this was Jacob had already given his name, which means he was already submissive and he, he had lost and he gave leverage to God. But the cooler part was when you look at this, This Christophany, whether it's Christ or whether it's God, doesn't give his name. That alludes to me and you something really important. Mankind will always be in submission to God, but he will never be in submission to us. He owes us nothing. We will never have an advantage over him. We will never have leverage over him. If there's a point where you think you have leverage over God, you're in a very, very dangerous place. What happens next is really cool. He doesn't even answer him. He doesn't even pretend to answer him. He doesn't even recognize that he asked what his name is. He just blesses him. That is a gangster move. Because he goes, you want to know? I'm not going to tell you what my name is. I'm not going to tell you who I am. I'm just going to show you who I am. You're blessed. That's awesome. You already knew who I was. I'm not going to tell you who I am. I'm not going to give you leverage. I'm not going to do it. You want to know who I am? I'll just show you. You're blessed. He blesses them. Here's something really interesting. Jacob's physical and spiritual walk was never the same after this encounter. And that should be true for every single one of us. When a person trusts Christ as personal Savior, everything should change. Their lives will never be the same and people will know it and people should see it. Understand that, that when he had this encounter, his hip was taken out of joint and that he always had a limp from there on out physically. Look at all the people that had an encounter 
uh, you have Jacob, you have Zacchaeus, you have Saul, you have Peter, you have John, you have the demonic man and tons of other people in the New Testament that when they have an encounter with Jesus Christ, they are no longer the same. They are very, very different. And the rest of the world and everyone else can see it physically. When we have an encounter with Jesus Christ and we come to the end of ourselves, when we come to the breaking point where we empty ourselves of ourselves, our walk should be distinctly and discernibly different to those people around us. We should be so, so different the the way that we carry ourselves that they go, what happened to you? What do you think is going to happen when Jacob sees Esau, when he sees his wives and his servants and his 11 sons, that they're, he, and now he's got this, this limp in them. They're going to, first thing they're going to say is, what happened to you? What happened to you? Let me tell you what happened to me. An encounter with God in the flesh, and it changed my life. That's the same for us. As we get ready to close, there are two very important things that we need to address before we leave here. Neither one of them is comfortable. But I want to ask you this very difficult question. Number one, have you been to Jabbok? Or have you just been to Bethel? See, Bethel is where Jacob believed in God and where he met God. And he goes, yes, there is a God. I know that there's a God. I know that God is out there and I know that God cares about me. And so he's been to Bethel. But there's a difference between going to Bethel and going to Jabbok. See, the world that we live in today, we have a lot of people who are content with going to Bethel. They're content with being at Bethel and going, yes, I believe in God and I believe that he had a son and I believe that he died for my sins. And that makes you a great Christian. But when you go to Jabbok, that's what makes you a great disciple. And there's a difference between the two. See, uh, disciples serve as a form of worship. I'm going to come and I'm going to serve God and I'm going to do whatever God asks as a form of my worship. Christians serve to attain comfort and peace of mind. Someone who's been to Bethel and understands that there is a God doesn't understand what it means to go to Jabbok and to serve sacrificially and to do the things that it takes sacrificially, not for their own gain, not for anything other than that. They're going to do it as a form of worship. That's a disciple. Disciples will go and do whatever is asked regardless of the cost. It doesn't matter what it costs. It doesn't matter how tough it is. I'm going to go no matter what. But a Christian will go and do until things get difficult or inconvenient. Disciples will worship no matter what presents itself, no matter what is happening. Christians will worship until something better or more fun presents itself. Disciples passionately search for God's agenda. Christians hope that God's agenda fits into theirs. Disciples continually ask God for his attributes and his characteristics, and Christians continually ask God to bless their attitudes and their characteristics. Disciples come to church to be challenged and to pursue truth. Christians come to church to be entertained and to feel good about themselves on the inside. I don't don't mean to disappoint you. I don't mean to make you uh, upset with me. But when you come to church, you should not show up going, man, I hope I leave here feeling really good about myself. That means that I have failed and delivering a message to you. It should feel like a gut punch every single day because, listen, you are here one hour a week and the rest of the time you are out in a sin-filled world owned by Satan himself who is evil incarnate. And listen, our job is to make sure that you get stronger, that you grow in your faith, that you grow in your life. And there is pain involved and there is work involved and there is hurt involved. And we have to tear away the masks of the things that the world wants us to believe that is screaming in our ears for hours and hours and hours and hours. And so yes, when you show up here, it should be a gut punch. Listen, I have to do better. I am not the Christian that I thought I was. I'm not the disciple that I thought I was. I'm not the person that I thought I was. God, I owe you more. I owe you more than I'm giving you. And so we need to understand that Jabbok is a real place and it is a conflict in your life that is life changing. It leaves a mark. Do people look at you and go, what happened to you? Is it so evident or do you walk and talk and act just like the rest of the people out there in the world that makes you a Christian and not a disciple? So I want to ask you that question, have you been to Jabbok? And the second part here, which is very, very personal. 
It goes back to where I started. The strength to hold on is so much more stronger than we give it credit for. To just hold on. To wrestle with God. Too many people, too many Christians, too many wrestle with God to get their dominance or their will or whatever they want over him. They want to defeat him. They want to overpower him. God, I'm going to wrestle with you until you give me what I want, until you give me the blessing that I want to have. And they don't understand that it's not a wrestling match to win. It's a wrestling match to just hold on. Can you imagine what it would be like if you lived your life every waking moment just holding on to him to the point where he's like, would you just get off of me? Why won't you let me go, man? Because I need you. I ain't getting through this without you. Here's the difficult part. For some of you in here right now, you're like, bro, you are speaking to me, I am holding on. I am in the darkest part of the night. I'm using everything I got to just hold on. I'm just holding on. Like you don't understand. If he doesn't show up, I don't know what's going to happen. If God doesn't show up, if Jesus doesn't intervene, if I don't get a blessing from him, you don't understand. I'm broken. I'm on my knees. I'm in a bad place. I'm in the darkness. I'm in the wilderness. I'm all alone. I have nothing to my name. You don't understand, Josh. You're, you're talking to me. If he doesn't show up, tomorrow's coming and I got to answer for those things tomorrow. Listen. Hold on. Don't quit. Don't give up. You use, Josh, you don't understand. You don't understand the pain, man. You don't understand how bad it hurts. Josh, you don't understand what's going on. I, listen, hold on. Hold on. Don't let go. Don't give up. Don't you dare quit. You hold on because he is your hope. He is your answer. He will not fail you. He will show up. He doesn't know how to fail. Hold on. Don't quit. Don't quit. Just hold on. I know that it's going to take all your strength. I know it. I know it. And you're like, Josh, you don't understand where I'm at. You're right, I don't. Hold on. Just hold on. Don't let go. Understand this. And I'm going to be done. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. Think about this. There's a reality to this that we have to wrap our, our conscience around. That when Jacob, who was undeserving in every single way, his name for his entire life was just nothing but nasty, uh, negative things, a liar, a thief, a manipulator, and a deceiver. That's what people knew him as. Comes to the end of himself at the darkest point of his life and the darkest place in his life, out in a sin-filled wilderness where anything could happen. He has nothing left to his name. He is all alone. And here's what I want to show you. Out of nowhere, God showed up. Out of nowhere. And when he showed up, Jacob never let go. He didn't let go. He held on. And because he simply held on, because he simply endured, because he simply would not let go, he was blessed. Because God wants us to want him. And when we come to the end of ourselves, the greatest form of love that we can show him is to come to the end of ourselves and say, listen, without you, I am nothing and I need you. You're my hope. You're my answer. You're everything to me. That's what makes you a disciple. And that's when he says, my dad's satisfied, you're blessed. Father, thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity to open your word. I thank you for the message that you've given me. I ask, as I always do, that it was received well, that hearts and minds were attentive and that it made sense and that it was clear. Father, the one thing that I do want to ask, and I've been praying about this all week as I've been working and going over this message is the reality and the truth to it is this. I don't know how many individuals in here are saying they are at the end of their rope and they are at the darkest part of the night just before the dawn breaks and tomorrow's coming. I'm going to ask on their behalf, if they have not already, that you would just show up 
And that when you show up, they recognize it and they don't let go. They hold on to you in understanding that you are their only hope, that you are their answer, that you will get them through. Father, for those of us that don't know that our Jabbok is coming this week or next week or next month, as you prepare them to get ready for it, as you prepare them to go through it, as you prepare them to just deal with it, I pray that they would have the wisdom to say, oh my gosh, I am in the darkest part. I am in the most hurtful part. I, I'm at every disadvantage and things hurt that they would just hold on to you. I pray that our love for you would be so strong that we just understand without you, we're not gonna make it. Father, we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen.